At this time, I'm happy to introduce our keynote speaker for our sixth AATS annual forum, Dr. Francisco Gayoba. Francisco Gayoba, Dr. Francisco Gayoba comes to us from AUP. He is the president for the Adventist University of Philippines since 2011. He has worked in the seminary and as a teacher for 12 years. He has also worked as a field pastor for eight years and five years in the union. And we are happy to have Dr. Francisco Goyoba to be our keynote speaker who will be speaking to us on the topic, doing theology in a time of fake news. Shall we all welcome Dr. Francisco Goyoba? Thank you for the kind introduction. Good morning to each one of you. It's a pleasure for me to be invi invited to this forum and to be back in this room. <laughs> to the Lord uh, blessed uh, the years that I spent here teaching and it's, it was a wonderful uh, experience uh, to learn from this institution and also from uh, the students in the interaction. Um, mine is a keynote uh, address, and if we follow the purpose of the keynote address, I believe I was requested to speak to reiterate several issues or themes which from my side should be the focus or the result of, an, of, an co of a conference such as this. So thus, many of what I'm going to say are not new or we can say uh, trailblazing research. But what I want to do today is to emphasize certain directions which I firmly believe should be taken by the participants in this forum which, with the theme that we have chosen. But first, some foreword. When I refer to theology in my talk, unless specified, I use it in a historical comprehensive sense, encompassing not only systematics, but also includes the disciplines of the biblical, historical, and practical theology. So I believe it concerns almost all of uh, you, rather than those in systematics only. And I put forward this presentation with the belief that we should do theology because of the changing context that uh, we are facing in the different institutions and churches that we work for. And I hope it is not too late to influence some of your research and the projects and whatever activities you have uh, in the future. Let me start by saying that uh, early this week, we at AUP, I believe also PCU, and I'm not sure whether IAS was also uh, part of that experience, we um, went through something that was uh, unique. Sunday evening, we received a text from the mayor's office that due to the strength of incoming Typhoon Maria, Classes in Silang, in all levels, were suspended, will be suspended for the next day, Monday. We in AUP usually are, we don't know what to do because if the reason for the suspension is flooding, by the time AUP is flooded, then half of Central Luzon will be flooded uh, Already, I think the same here in Aya. So many times we are struggling. But after several, you know, the past few years, shall we follow or not? Finally, we decided whatever the local government uh, orders, advises, we will follow. So, but in spite of the advisory, I went to the internet and checked the Pagasa, you know, the Weather Bureau. And I was surprised that there was no severe weather bulletin or no warning. And yet, the mayor's office uh, issued 
cancellation of classes. The next day, Monday, was sunny and fair, but we held no classes. So we had a little problem with our students who were mostly dormitorians. What will they do the rest of the day? And I think you know there was a lot of requests to get out of the campus. And as I checked, because I keep on asking, where's the typhoon? Where's the typhoon? As I check later in the day, in fact, the report was that the typhoon had weakened as it entered the Philippine area of responsibility. So what happened? We discovered later on that because of what the, the offices of the local leaders saw in social media that there was uh, described as a super typhoon that will bring heavy rain and extensive flooding worse than Yolanda. <laughs> That's what I heard only. So the mayor and others suspended classes. We were a recipient of fake news. Fake news. Did you have, did you have the same experience too? I don't know what happened here in Ayas. I think Ayas students are not affected by weather at all. <laughs> you know, fake news is defined as spreading of disinformation online or in the traditional media. It has something to do with false information based on non existent or distorted data that were meant to deceive and manipulate the reader. So there is an intention to give false information. Moreover, that information is based on non-existent or distorted uh, data. How would you like to submit a thesis on non-existent or uh, distorted uh, data? There's another development just like fake news that is the subject of several theological papers the past few years. In 2016, I think you know why in 2016, there's a lot of, uh, there were a lot of political events that happened in uh, 2016, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well. In 2016, the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year was... Uh, Post-truth. Post-truth. Defined as, quote, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. So post-truth is a situation where people are confronted with objective facts and then data or what on opinion that appeals more on emotion and personal belief and what do they choose uh, opinion on based on emotion and personal belief in the post truth era is when people are more likely to be persuaded by emotional opinions rather than objective facts and logic. Many times, they respond more positively to a palatable or repackaged lie rather than the hard truth or data, where statistics are not so much welcome as news that they read from social media. Friends, brothers and sisters, we are in the news and truth profession, aren't we? We are dealing with news, the good news. We'll, we're dealing with truth. In Seventh-day Adventist uh, tradition especially, we are, we are dealing with the everlasting gospel in Revelation 14. And the theological disciplines where we belong to have different purposes. For biblical studies, the object is to discover truth in the biblical passages. For systematicians, 
how to organize and present truth within the framework of the majority of the people listening to us or target audience. For those in applied theology, presenting the good news and studying how truth can impact and transform lives and organizations and, uh, and is our purpose. So how do we respond to the age of fake news and post-truth? Especially for us, the challenge is greater because of our stand on the primac primacy of scriptures and the nature of truth of the scriptures. Some, many students today respond to the era by suggesting that perhaps we should change our message or another option is we do not change our message but we change the way we present the message. So what to do? For perhaps we should begin in, in our study or review of how to respond to post-truth era by trying to understand what kind of context are we facing. What is the post-truth all about and what kind of context are we facing? By the way, as I will show, as I will mention later, a lot of what we call post-truth today actually is connected with the phenomenon of, I believe many of you have been studying about post-modernism. I will not discuss post-modernism so much. I'll assume that you, have, you are familiar with it. But since we are discussing about religious pluralism, some of you may, dis may uh, dismiss the post-truth issue because you are coming from tribal areas. That is not the case. Even though you come from, we can say, developing countries or areas that are still in rural or tribal understanding, we cannot dismiss the challenges of post-truth or post-modernism. Since the late 1990s, French sociologist Michel Mafisoli had been arguing that the emerging communities that we have now, although post-modern, are not entirely new, but have a lot of manifestations of the pre-modern Tribal, tribal communities. In fact, he's saying that a lot of the groups that we have now, especially the groups that are united through their interest in the social media platforms, he would call them the neo-tribals. Because a lot of the characteristics that they share are really characteristic of tribal peoples. So what I'm saying is, even though you are serving or you come from tribal areas, you will benefit a lot from understanding postmodernism because the responses to postmodernism will apply very well to the tribal areas that you serve. That is what this group of sociologists led by Maf Mafisoli, had been trying to tell us the past few years. So what to do? How to respond? If you will indulge me first as a historian, you know historians like answering the question, why did this happen? What, are the back what is the background or the roots of, the of this phenomenon? If you don't mind, I would like to review a little bit or go over with you the antecedents of the post-truth era. First, I'm doing this so that we can have a better foundation of the responses that we will be suggesting later. First, 
the post-truth mentality is can actually be based on human nature, sinful human nature. This is what Pope Francis had been uh, uh, pro had pronounced, released by the Vatican on how we un I understood post-truth. He was saying it began in the Garden of Eden when uh, Eve believed the serpent. You see, the problem of post-truth is first of all rooted in human nature. Psychologists tell us or re uh, refer to us what we call the confirmation bias. That people have a tendency to only pay attention to news or facts that confirm beliefs they already hold. Confirmation bias is something that applies to all, regardless of how open-minded we believe we are. Reflect on your uh, reaction. If somebody tells you something, if, it's fab if you already have it, you will easily believe it. But if it's uh, different from what you believe, probably you will dismiss it the first time. And then if you really force, then you look at it again. If really forced to do so. This phenomenon related to it is that even when presented with information that contradicts what we believe, we have a tendency to resist new information. Studies have shown that attempts to debunk or uh, rebuttal bad information simply strengthen people in their wrong position because of the tendency in human nature. I believe those of you in administration make this decision. If we push too much, if we counteract too much, it may harden their position. So sometimes we make a decision, just leave it alone. <laughs> Let them be. Or else it might make solving the problem more difficult. Likewise, related to post-truth, as human beings, it's a reality that much of our decision-making does not stem or arise from rationality, but because we are social beings, Usually, we make decisions depending on the group that we are part of. So much of the phenomenon of post-truth, actually, can be, re can be connected to which group they belong to. Which persuasion do they adhere to? And people will believe that direction or that position because of the grouping that they are part. And most of the time, human beings do not decide or make decisions based on rational thinking process. In the new ed general education curriculum that we are implementing now, to develop critical thinking among college students is one of the outcomes. But having observed college students graduate, I really don't know how much of our college students have developed critical thinking. Even in the United States, where critical thinking is already taught from the elementary years, I have seen studies that when they measure critical thinking, it seems education is not that successful. Even they have spent years and years and years opening or presenting critical thinking or teaching critical thinking to the pupils. Because maybe it's our human nature that we are lazy to think. <laughs> when we are forced to make a decision, we think of shortcuts, we ask our friends what do they think, rather than really struggling and looking at the options and outlining everything. We want to take the easy way out. We, want, we depend on our hunches, on what we know before, what philosophers uh, call the heuristic way of making decisions. And of course, as I mentioned, because of the group that we come from. Much of the post-truth mentality may be explained by the rise of information and communications technology. Much of it. Let me 
explain it more a little bit. For me, the best explanation is offered by Jacques Ellul, a French philosopher and sociologist who is also a committed biblical Christian and lay theologian. Ellul's theological works are attempts to analyze the world around him. He does that as a sociologist. And then to speak from the word of God into the world that he describes in order that Christianity may resist the destructive effect and powers and to bring hope and freedom. His sociological interpretations are integrated with extensive theological, ethical, and biblical studies. His two most influential books are The Technological Society. It's good. It's heavy reading, but it's good. Unfortunately, we don't have a copy of that in our library, but we have a copy of The Propaganda, the bo his book on propaganda, The Formation of Men's Attitude. What is the thinking of Elul. How does he explain what's happening to our society? He, he died a few years ago. He wrote in the, the 1960s, but even now his books and his interpretation of what's happening to our society is still the basis of a lot of doctoral dissertations and explanations. Elul would say that arising from the Industrial Revolution, was the technological revolution. And look at the gadgets that we have today. But Elul would say that we, the, mod the modern technological society is actually run by a certain mentality he co or a certain way of doing things that he calls technique or technology. It is a rational method of doing things and the main purpose is absolute efficiency in business, in education, in medicine, whatever. The main focus is efficiency. Elul was not against technological machines. But what he was pointing out was that once we use those machines, many times we cannot control what's happening to our lives. Once we use it. Because we become part of the system. He, his understanding of, you know, historians explain what's happening in many ways. Those who are fond of explaining ideas explain that ideas are the, is the most important factor in explaining what's happening in the world. Ilul is more like a materialist. He was saying... You want to understand the changes that is taking place, you understand it from a material point of view. What you eat, what you do, what are the things that you use, actually explain better and has a higher impact on the changes in our lives. And because of that mentality, businesses, schools, education, he was attacking education a little bit, with all of the focus on efficiency, right now we want to be more efficient so that we can compete globally in the job market. If we use the interpretation of Elul, he's saying, all these approaches are totalitarian. Whether you like it or not, all of these procedures and structures all together fit and they have an effect on, the, on our lives and in your life and even in our thinking. As an example, this is not Elul now, but those, the interpreters of Elul. Look at how the internet, television, mobile phones, and other computer-based devices or screens are changing and affecting our lives. Not just on the economic aspect, but also the political level. And also the individual level, our health, our relationships, do screens and internet affect our relationships? Do they affect our families? Yes. Do they affect our health? That just the other day, I was reading a study that the, the amount of hours you spend using on the screen, whatever screen it is, for children that is, it causes the attention deficit phenomenon that we have. A lot of things are affected by 
by what we do. My friends, it's even reshaping our brains. And let me emphasize this because it's related to post-truth. People who spend a lot of time you on their screens, especially on social media, they, the moment they do it, their brain gets get used to that, the part of the brain that are the emotional areas are frequently used. So the more we use social media for entertainment, and most people use social media for entertainment, very few people use in, uh, social media to study. Uh, we, have the, we have the figures already. So, when they use it for entertainment, to laugh, to cry, you know, their emotions are involved. So, the more that they use it, all the time, the area of the brain that is on the emotional side is the one that is developed and developed and grows and grows and strengthened. Even if you argue with them rationally, because they don't use the part of the brain frequently, they cannot think clearly and they will not be interested. So now we have official, we have a neurological explanation of post-truth. Why is it that people are not interested in facts so much? Because most of the time, the area of the brain that is used are the emotional <laughs> entertainment areas, not the rational, logical parts of the brain. So that when something happens to them, when they get an information, they don't use the frontal <laughs> lobe. They use the entertainment, pleasure centers of the brain. You may be aware now that I share with Ilul the view that technology has changed our worldview, our understanding of life. Can you imagine the kind of change that we need to do so that people will use more their frontal lobes than the pleasure centers? That's a lot of work and challenge. If we want our response to post-truth to really be long-standing and high impact, that's a big challenge. And what happens? All of these changes, the brain, the social dimensions, they have made changes in our culture. I have not really read enough. Maybe there's not enough study yet. How postmodernism can be based directly connected to technology. But maybe, for example, the, the aspect of distrust to authority. Is it connected to how they use technology? I already mentioned to you only the desire for pleasure rather than rational thinking. It's affected by technology. But one thing is sure, the technological society is the antecedent of postmodernism as an intellectual or ideological approach to reality. In fact, there are several books that appeared a few years ago. One of them is from Lee McIntyre, when he argues that the post-truth phenomenon is a manifestation of post-modernism, meaning post-truth was riding on the post-modernist philosophy and thinking, just took it captive, and now we call it post-truth, especially the idea that there's no such thing as objective truth. So. To the second part of my talk, what to do now? How do we do theology vis-a-vis -vis these developments? What papers, what directions, what projects? How will this affect our practice? Just to review that the general approach that we read about, the general approach to postmodernism outlines several of the following. Number one, postmodernism emphasizes the particular, the timely, and the practical. So the postmodernist will only respond or be attracted to what we're saying if they are particular, the timely, and the practical. Maybe no problem if we use the Bible properly because the Bible is particular, timely, and practical. 
And if we want to reach postmodernists, we have to learn how to communicate to their concerns, sensitivities, and values. They value relationships. So how is it in our ministry? They value modest, simple things rather than a big structure, whether it's ideas or buildings or institutions. They like smaller institutions. And then they value the dialogical, the discussion, the interaction type. Let me give my suggestions now of doing theology in terms of the disciplines. The first one for biblical theologians. Any biblical theologians here? For biblical theologians. Remember the purpose of biblical theology, at least for the, uh, those who put the primacy of scriptures. The purpose is to discover what the Bible meant so that what it means today can be communicated properly, right? So, dear friends, biblical theologians, please remember that the main purpose of your exegesis, of your hermeneutics, or if I followed the hermeneutical cycle or spiral, is not that you come up with what it meant but you must think also of what it means today. So what does this passage mean today? If you do not end with what it means today, then the Bible has no meaning for postmoderns. And those of you who are in biblical studies, let me encourage you that since the end of biblical studies is communication, and I'm not talking about academic papers. That will only be for a few years or if you teach in the seminary. Most of the, most of the application of biblical studies will be preaching and teaching. Preach and teach in a personal, imaginative way so that the people can understand what the Bible means today. Learn how to preach well. The Bible, so that the Bible can have meaning. I wish biblical theologians will have more training in preaching. Because if we want the Bible to be alive, then the biblical theologians have to master preaching so that the Bible will become dear and close to the hearts of our people. Learn how to preach inductively. Storytelling, preach for transformation, master it, or else what you discover, what the Bible meant, has no value or impact to what the Bible means today. Indeed, as Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful when you share the results of your exegesis, is it alive and powerful? If it's not, people who listen will say, ah, the Bible is outdated. It doesn't mean anything useful today. The task is yours, dear friends. It's alive and powerful. It exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. You see there? The needs of the people are addressed when you preach the Bible. That is the task of biblical theologians. I wish we have more good biblical theologians in the church so that the Bible and its message. Do you believe that the biblical message is relevant all the time? Yes, but the task is ours, to you, biblical theologians, to make it. How many times I have heard biblical theologians preach, it's just like they're delivering step one, step two, step three of an exegetical paper. There is no much relevancy in what, forget the steps in exegesis, you do it only to understand what 
it meant now you have to reorganize your sermon to make it alive and powerful. That is the task of biblical theology. For systematic and historical theologians, let me challenge you. Let's make a connection between the natural world and what's happening around us to biblical teachings. I am asking this because as a trained I also studied theology in my master theology level. Many times when we make studies, we connect it to this theologian or that theologian or that philosopher. For a group of Christians who believe that the, that revelation is not only in the Bible, but God also speaks to what happens every day. Do you believe so? In the natural world. While we put primacy in scriptures, we also believe that the Holy Spirit is active and God works in the world. So why don't we connect what's happening in our world to the biblical teachings? Let me recommend that when you write papers and dissertations, study psychology. Psychology is the philosophy of people today. May much of their explanations of what's happening in their lives comes from psychological theory. Systematic theologians, rather than connecting to this philosopher or that theologian, why don't you connect to psychological theories or sociology or economics? So that the, 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 the systems, the explanations, the rational connections that we, connect, that we make about life and biblical teachings and doctrines will be relevant to people. Explore life's essential questions, the worldview in dialogue with the physical and human sciences. Explore holistic moral reasoning based on what's happening in the world around us. Use recent developments in sociology and psychology, data that you can get from studies Connect it to biblical teachings so that in the end, people will know that biblical teachings, doctrines are relevant. And let me suggest, tell stories more often. This was a major challenge for me. As a trained theologian, you know you already have, you know you have Aristotelian logic. Step one, step two, step three. And you can see it in the way systematic theology books are organized. You already know part one, part two, part three. You know, they already have a step. This one, that's how you write as a theologian. But when you use that step and that scheme in preaching, in teaching, in evangelistic meetings, you have a problem. Nobody is trained to think in Aristotelian logic and can understand you. You have to use common sense reasoning. <laughs> huh? You have a book here in the library, uh, Murphy. Uh, he, he talks here about reasoning. Learn how to tell stories so that, as 2 Timothy 3.15 tells us, with the Holy Scriptures, we, can may, we'll be, we are able to help men and help them to be wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We have a lot of challenges. It's nice to be trained in the seminary. But after the seminary, what's next? You have to change your thinking. You have to change your manner of explicating church doctrines and teachings. You have to be aware that the reasoning of the ordinary people is different from the reasoning of somebody who was trained in logic and discourse. It's much different. You know what? I, I'm, I'm, I've been repeating this again and again. It's so natural because you are, you, you are trained there for so many years. So when you speak in public, when you teach your students, even the college students, they are, it's too high for them. We must, we must be aware of the purpose of doing theology. And last, practical theologians. How many of you are in practic applied theology? Practics. Oh, there are many. Friends, I think you're already doing this. Please connect your studies with the practical issues in discipleship, evangelism, and mission. And don't forget church leadership and organization. I discover that many times 
church leadership in organization is not influenced by biblical theology and biblical ethics. In the church, I don't know, in your denomination many times, what is being followed is the business model rather than biblical ethics and bibli understanding of com biblical understanding of community and church. In view of the distrust for authority that characterizes postmodern, several writers propose that the, the approach of the organization in dealing with church members should not be so much authoritarian, but in humility and in sincerity and honesty. Unlike the business model that you know you have, uh, when so somebody commands it from the top, it's like that. But postmodernists are looking for humility from its leaders, sincerity, honesty, and simplicity to, thou, to those values and lifestyle they respond. Perhaps we should consider as we lead the church, many of you will lead the church. You will not just become scholars, but you will become administrators and leaders of the church. We must remember the proper stance. Another point to respond to post-truth and post-modernity is that when we pay too much attention on the rational, at the exclusion of the affective, the experiential, and the embodied, then we cannot teach truth successfully. One of the, one of the work that you have practical theologians, pastors, how to foster practices that will be relational at the same time bring about transformation in the lives of our members. For example, those of you who have been following in youth ministry and in, in mega churches, one of the problems we have in mega churches is the services are experiential. The services are entertaining. But after 10 to 15 years of mega churches, the question is, how much holiness has been brought about in the lives of those attending mega churches? Studies have shown, and the pastors of mega churches are struggling. Yes, we have all those nice strategies, but the members are not growing spiritually. They are not active in spreading the gospel. They demand so much on the full time pastors and program leaders of the mega churches. Where is the effect? That's the challenge of those of you in handling churches. Good strategies, yes, but the impact of holiness of life and sanctification for us who belong to the Wesleyan tradition is very, very important. Huh? The evidence of the gospel is the transformation of the life of the person. So we must think of those strategies. It's nice to have all of these songs and all the, okay, okay, all of those uh, innovative worship, okay. But what's the effect? What's the effect? my dear friend. So let us build up our congregations. Let's do evangelism with this in mind. You know, uh, the, the evangelism of the 1970s that builds on the business model where there are so much baptisms, it seems at this point now is having a negative effect on the postmodern. Let me rephrase what I'm saying. If you have so many baptisms without the corresponding discipleship, what do you have? Many church members whose lives have not been transformed. So when the postmodern people look at it, they are Christians. They've been baptized, but their life is not much different from the lives of other people there. And when the postmodern think, but the, the power of the gospel is shown by, the transformed, by a transformed life. So if we have so many baptisms without discipleship, we are actually turning away the postmodern because to them the evidence of the power of the gospel is the holiness and the sense of community in the churches. What's the purpose of having so many church members if the sense of community and love cannot be seen in our churches? 
rather than bringing in the postmodern, we are turning them off because they do not see the corresponding changes that should result from evangelism and mission. Yes, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Postmoderns will understand this. And that is the post truth thinking. I, it's true when I see it in the lives of the leaders and the church members. How to bring about that community is a challenge for practical theologians. Let me close. I hope that my brief reflections, though a little bit of tangent with pluralism, will help you apply or get the challenge of what you can do in your specific disciplines. May God bless you.